Earlier this year, uh, I did a series called Basic Training, and I would assume most of you remember that if you were here during that time. My goal in that series was to present eight uh, kind of eight big picture ideas, eight important lessons for Christ followers, and I used my own experiences in my brief time at West Point uh, going through basic training kind of as a a basis for illustrations during that series. And again, my aim there being to, to, um, to help our folks see, to help uh, all of us see some basic things. If someone was new to the faith, if someone was a new believer, what are eight important lessons that I would want that person to know about what it means to follow Christ? Um, and the reason that I called it basic training is I was presenting an overview of each of these items, and there, was, there were some things that you could certainly go deeper on. Well, even looking back to my own time in basic training, there were some areas in which they had to go a little bit deeper than what initially you would, you know, just kind of an overview or whatever. Uh, one example that I thought of this past week was when they... Uh, when they gassed us, when they hit us with gas. Now, some of you I've talked about this before. Uh, you're like, where is he going with this? I assume it was tear gas. I don't know what it was. In the military, they do all sorts of things to you that you don't know what it is, and you just don't ask. They're giving you shots. They're doing all this stuff. Like, you don't have a clue. It's just, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, or whatever, and they're doing that, right? So they're like, oh, we're going to hit you with gas. I'm like, okay, don't know what it is, but all right. Well, I can tell you that when, we, when they hit us with that gas, whatever it was, they didn't just tell us a couple things and then throw us in the room and then release the gas canisters. I promise you it wasn't like that. Um, they had to go a little bit deeper before we got into the room. Now, they did tell us that time what was going to happen or whatever. But prior to that, they had showed us some other things, uh, kind of m more detailed information. For instance, uh, they had taken the time to show us how the mask operates, right? Just to hand someone a gas mask and say, use it. Well, you don't necessarily know exactly how it works, and they had showed us that. Uh, also, uh, they showed us how to make sure, as a part of that, that it fits and it seals. Because if it does not seal, it's not going to help you that much. And so you need to make sure that it, it, it seals on your face. Also, how to clean it after you're done with it. And so um, if you have a, a gas mask there, there was a certain way we had to make sure that it was all cleaned. Otherwise, it would be contaminated uh, for the next time you would need to use it or whatever. And so there, uh, with all that training in place, they led us into a closed room or whatever, and they lined the new cadets on each wall. And so we were there. There was one group on the other wall. I was on, we'll say, this wall. And there were, I don't know, two or three different guys in there that were kind of conducting the gassing, if you will. And so uh, basically what they did is told everybody to don their gas mask, which we did, um, then they released the gas, and they went one by, they told us what we were going to do, and they went one by one. I mean, it would be bad enough if it was all at once, but it was even worse that it was one by one, and especially if you're like the last guy. I think I was next to last. So I'm watching what's happening to everyone else, anticipating that it's going to be my turn soon, and I'm standing there, and I'm watching, and so what they would do is they would come to you, they would stand in front of you, they would point at you and say, you or whatever you take your mask off and then they would say state your name and social security number and i'm watching these people when it's their turn they're going oh, 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 oh. like words are not actually coming out and i'm thinking what in the world is going on here and i'm feeling the tingling on my skin or whatever on, like around the, where the edges of the mask or whatever and i'm thinking oh this thing gonna be good well some guys had been prior service military in other words they were enlisted before they went to west point and they had said, take a deep breath before you take your mask off and then breathe out while you're doing it. The problem with that is that what they're asking you to say and do and the fact that they're physically holding you in place, not grabbing you, but they're not letting you out the door, uh, you, you can't hold your breath that long. You're going to run out of air or whatever. And so at some point, you're going to be breathing this stuff in. And so I remember they came and they said, you, whatever, you take it off. And just like everyone else, Name, social security number. <laughs> like you literally can't speak. There's no word. I'm trying to talk and no words are coming out. And 
Meanwhile, my eyes are burning or whatever, and the only instinct I have is to get out of the room. And so I'm trying to get out of the room, and there just happens to be this really big man blocking the door. And he will not let you out until he's ready to let you out. So when he finally lets you out, like it's light all of a sudden, but I can't see what's going on. At some point, I realize that I'm both drooling and there's snot hanging down from my nose, probably two feet or whatever, and I'm just kind of wandering around like this or whatever, trying to get my bearings. And then they're like, good job, good job when you're coming out of the room. What a wonderful experience. You say, what on earth does that have to do? Well, he's preaching on giving this morning. It must be about to get gas or something. No, 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 no. For me, personally, to preach on this topic, and maybe it does feel like I'm about to get gassed or something, but I'll talk about that in just a moment. The point is that there are some things, uh, even in basic training, that you have to go over in more detail. And so when I gave the sermon, when I gave those eight important lessons, I specifically did not do uh, a sermon on giving. I did a sermon, and I called it Life Stewardship, because in reality, giving is a subset of something bigger uh, than that. It's actually stewarding our lives or, or managing our lives well for the Lord. That is a part of that, but that's not the whole of it. And so I touched on giving briefly in that, but I didn't get too far into it. And so uh, we're not going to bring this up on the screen, but just as an example, the, uh, the big takeaway from that particular sermon was this, as followers of Jesus, we should strive to steward our lives well for Him. And then when I went to the application there, I talked about things like stewarding our gifts and talents, uh, beware of squandering the time we've been given. And I talked about how money should, not be, it should be a tool and not an idol, things like that. And so as you look at that big picture... Giving is a part of that, but not the whole of it. And so I wanted to make sure if I've only got eight lessons to cover these big areas, I have to get to that first. But a giving is a significant part of the life of the church and of individual believers. And so um, we're going to address it today in large part because we have a business meeting today and it's an opportunity for us to talk about it. So uh, don't have too many visitors today. I, I will give my standard disclaimers because, sadly, uh, the reputation, unfortunately, of ev evangelical pastors and churches is bad in this area. And so I will give my standard disclaimers. One, I don't preach like I'm about to very often. And so most of the time we're going through a book of the Bible. And in fact, that's what we're going to be doing, Lord willing, next week. So next week, Lord willing, we go back to the Gospel of Luke. And I'm no one is happier about that than yours truly. So uh, the way they trained us to preach, uh, you take a text, you go through it. Like that, that's how it's, it's, it's so deeply ingrained in me that to not preach that way is difficult. I have to force myself, but I'm going to do it this morning. The other thing is just that bad stereotype. Oh, the church only wants your money or the pastor only wants your money. Uh, I, <laughs> friends, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, in fact, if there's an error in my own ministry, it's not preaching and teaching on this enough because God's Word does actually address these issues. And so because of my reluctance to deal with this topic, because I don't want to be associated with the, the uh, kind of health and wealth, you know, sow your seed and all this kind of stuff, like I don't want to be associated with that. So maybe the pendulum swings the other direction. You don't want to talk about it, but when God's Word deals with it, we need to deal with it. Okay, I'm called to preach and teach the full counsel of God. And so whether I like it personally or not, there is a time and a place to discuss giving. And that is where we're at this morning. Because I'm committed to preach and teach the whole counsel of God, and because uh, this issue is something we're going to be discussing in our business meeting today, it was an opportunity for me to um, say, okay, I'm going to preach what God's Word says on this topic. And so my aim this morning as a part, kind of an appendix to the basic training series, is to give you an overview of what the Bible teaches about giving. I'm not going to go super deep into it. We're going to look at several different Scripture passages. Um, it's not going to be as detailed as it could be or whatever. Well, you didn't talk about this or whatever. I get it. I mean, at some point you have one lesson to do this. So I'm going to do the best that I can to give you an overview on this. And so... Let's start this morning with our big takeaway, and that's how I did throughout the series, uh, the basic training series, is to start off with a big takeaway. And so if I'm looking at the whole of Scripture, 
and I'm saying, okay, people of God giving, what is a bit, what's the big takeaway we can get from Scripture on this? It's, it's what you have on the screen in front of you there. God uses his people's giving to provide materially for their corporate worship, ministry, and missions. Now, you may think that's a long point. I promise you, what I had written in my notes originally was like way longer than that. That's condensed. So I had lots of uh, qualifications and things to that. This is the best summary I could come up with of what biblical teaching is on giving. God uses His people's giving to provide materially for their corporate worship. In other words, their, their, their uh, gathered worship um, materi- for their ministry, um, which would include those who minister vocationally and missions. And so that, that's the best summary that I could come up with. Now, what we're going to do, like we did in the basic training series, is we're going to walk through a handful of Scripture references, Scripture passages. Uh, I'll try to give you a little bit of the context and kind of show you what that passage says relative to giving, and then we'll work through those. And then um, I've got one kind of other thing I want to touch on, and then we'll get to the application. So that's the structure for today's message. So let's start out this morning in Genesis. Um, if we're going we're gonna to go kind of back to the beginning, let's go back to the first book in the Bible. And we're going to be in the book of Genesis. Um, and we'll see what is said in the book of Genesis. Not everything that's said in Genesis, but at least in this particular passage. Um, interestingly, when I preached through uh, the life of Abraham in Genesis, this was actually the one sermon that I didn't do because Pastor Mark preached this. And so this passage was King Cheddar, if you remember. uh, Mark called uh, Cheddar Laomer, he called him King Cheddar. And so this was a message that Pastor Mark did. So I didn't actually even have notes on this section. It says, then after his return, and that is Abraham or Abram. um, Then after his return from the defeat of Cheddar Laomer and the kings who were with him, uh, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of, of Shava, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He, that is Abram, gave him, that is Melchizedek, a tenth of all. He gave him a tenth of all. And so what this is, is this is the first reference in Scripture that we have to the practice of tithing. Um, When you ask what what is tithe, if someone hears the word tithe, and they're wondering, what does that mean? What is that? Uh, Essentially what that is, is a tenth. And so the word is not used in that passage, but basically in the aftermath of this uh, miniature war that Abram has been in, uh, trying to uh, rescue his nephew Lot and those who are with him or whatever, uh, this, this priest comes out, this mysterious Melchizedek, who's spoken of in the book of Hebrews. This is the appearance of Melchizedek in the Scriptures. We know that he's a king, and we know that he's a priest, which was not common. This is prior to the time of Moses, the Israelites, and all this. This is earlier in the days of Abram or Abraham. This, this priest king comes out. He has bread and wine. And man, I could camp out on that for a long time, like Melchizedek and Jesus. I mean, we could go. We're not going to do that today. But this priest comes out, and Abram's reaction or his response to this blessing that he receives, this, this, uh, this uh, time of thanksgiving, of, of blessing from this priest king, Abram's reaction is that he gives a tenth of all to Melchizedek. And it's just, he just kind of leaves it at that. It's just a remark. You're thinking, what in the world is that? Uh, effectively, what we're seeing is that for some reason, Abram, we don't know exactly why, because we don't have a reference to this prior to this. For some reason, Abram is compelled to give a tenth of what he has to this priest king. Um, there was a time of worship. Uh, There was a time of thanksgiving. There's a blessing from the priest king. And Abram's response is to give a tenth. Now Moses, generations later, writes this. And perhaps he was writing this kind of as a basis uh, to, to show that this practice was taking place long before the Israelites had the law. And then he kind of enshrines it in the law. And so ultimately, again, 
You're seeing Abram, the, the, the future kind of father of, of Israel, um, giving a tenth of all to the priest king at, at the time of an act of worship. And we're basically left there. There's not much other explanation. Now, I want to fast forward from that to the book of Numbers. Um, again, same author there would be Moses. But Moses gives uh, the Israelites the Old Testament law. Numbers chapter 18, and there's more spoken about tithes and offerings and things in the Old Testament law, but I, I want to give you one example, um, and that's in Numbers chapter 18. So beginning in verse 21, Moses writes this, "...to the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance, in return for their service which they perform, the service of the tent of meeting." The sons of Israel shall not come near the tent of meeting again, or they will bear sin and die. Pretty serious. Only the Levites shall perform the service of the tent of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations, and among the sons of Israel, they, that is the Levites, shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the sons of Israel, which they offer as an offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance." Therefore, I have said concerning them, they shall have no inheritance among the sons of Israel. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, When you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I have given you from, from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. In other words, 10% of 10%, which would be, for those math people out there, 1% right? Uh, your offering shall be reckoned to you as the grain from the threshing floor or the full produce from the wine vat. So you shall also present an offering to the Lord from your tithes, which you receive from the sons of Israel, and from it you shall give the Lord's offering to Aaron the priest. Out of all, of your, out of all your gifts you shall present every offering due to the Lord from all the best of them, the sacred part of them. You shall say to them, when you have offered from it the best of it, then the rest shall be reckoned to the Levites as the product of the threshing floor and as the product of the wine vat. You may eat it anywhere, you and your households, for it is your compensation in return for your service in the tent of meeting. You will bear no sin by reason of it when you have offered the best of it, but you shall not profane the sacred gifts of the sons of Israel, or you will die. All right. That's a lot of stuff there that requires some explanation. So what on earth is going on in that passage? What is being said there? When, when you, you've got, let me fast forward from one passage to the other. So you've got Abram, who was Abraham. His son was Isaac, or one of his sons. And then Isaac's son was Jacob, uh, one of his sons, who is later renamed by God as Israel. Now Israel had uh, 12 sons, right? And those ultimately, there's a little bit of nuancing required there, but ultimately those become the, the tribes of Israel. Now, Jacob and or Israel and his sons, they go down to Egypt, they're enslaved for 400 years, and then Moses leads them out. And when they're led out, they go to the promised land. Canaan, uh, the modern nation of Israel, kind of that region or whatever, the promised land. So when they are going into the land, when the Lord leads them into that land, they're going to divide up the land into these different areas. And every tribe is going to get a plot of ground that belongs to that tribe. So um, almost like we have our state boundaries or whatever. And so if you go down south just a little bit, you're going to hit the Ohio River. And then across the river is the state of... Come on, guys. <laughs> Most of you are from here. I'm not. I know that, right? So you go south just a little bit. You hit the Ohio River. On the other side is the state of? Okay, right? So we're divided up into states, much like that. The land was going to be divided among these tribes. However, there was one tribe that was not going to receive a large plot of ground. What tribe was that? It was the Levites. It was the descendants of, of Jacob's son, Levi, because that particular tribe had been tasked with something. And so that, that particular tribe had been tasked with the care of the tabernacle. 
Um, the tabernacle being the forerunner of the temple. It was the tent of meeting. It was the place where basically the Israelites came to offer their sacrifices. It was the place of corporate worship. And so this was a privilege. You say, well, being given this work was a privilege, friends? They, they, they came nearer, in a sense, to the Lord. The other people are told, don't touch the tent. But you, Levites, you get to, serve, you get to spend your time serving the Lord and so as a result of that, you're not going to have a plot of ground. Now, they were given little bits of ground around some of the cities or whatever. That's a whole other story. But by and large, they did not have a large plot of ground. So how are they supposed to eat? Well, they're supposed to eat based on the contributions of the people of Israel. And so when Israel comes to, to worship, they gather to worship, they are bringing their offerings, they're, they're, they're tithing uh, a tenth of, of their produce on these different things. They're bringing different offerings. And I, again, the language there gets a little confusing. Typically, when we refer in a church context to tithes and offerings, the tithe is the 10% part. The offering is above and beyond that. That language kind of gets blurred here. But the point is that the Levites are surviving based on the contributions of the people of God. And so the Levites are serving uh, in, in a form of vocational ministry. And as they are doing that, the way that they are, are basically surviving is the contributions of the people. Now, underneath the overall set of Levites is this subset, which are the priests. And those are the descendants of Aaron. Who is Aaron? Aaron is Moses' brother. Aaron is a Levite, right? But it's a subset. So you have the tribe of Levi, by this time, is quite a few people. And then you have thousands of people. And then you have Aaron and his sons who, who are the priests. And so out of the, the contributions that the Levites, receive, the Levites receive, they are going to give a portion of that for the uh, a provision for the priests. And so that's what you're seeing in the law here. Now Aaron's family grows, the Levites grow or whatever, and that is how... Uh, the people are going to provide for the priests and the Levites. That is the po- so the point that I'm trying to make here is this. Here we're seeing a basic principle kind of unfolding as we go through Scripture. That the people of God are supplying for the needs of those who are ministering vocationally and the ministry itself through these contributions. And so that is enshrined in the Old Testament law in the book of Numbers. Now we're going to fast forward way far from this, hundreds of years, to the passage in Nehemiah. Now, I'm not, we, we brought it up again here. I'm actually, it's, Gabe already read through the passage. I'm not going to read through the whole thing again, um, but I am going to kind of explain it because it does, I, I believe, require some explanation. And so this passage here, if you're familiar at all with the book of Nehemiah, you're probably familiar with the wall, right? If you know anything about the book of Nehemiah, So in between the time of Moses with the Old Testament law and the time of Nehemiah, a whole bunch of stuff happens. Moses leads them to the edge of the promised land. Moses dies. Joshua takes over, leads them into the promised land. The people go into the promised land. Uh, In the period of the judges, they turn away from the Lord. God sends judges to deliver them. Mixed success, they often turn away from the Lord. Finally, the people say, give us a king to rule over us like the nations. And God says, okay, I'm going to do it. So God gives them King Saul. Saul turns out to be a dud of a king. So God says, okay, I'm going to unseat him, and I'm going to put a man after my own heart in that role, and that is King David. Under King David and then under his son Solomon, Israel experiences its glory days. But sadly, in his later years, Solomon turns away from the Lord. And so God strips part of the kingdom away from Solomon's descendants, and you have split kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom of Israel. You have the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, Israel is led by bad kings throughout its existence, the northern tribes. And ultimately, God says, okay, had enough. And the Assyrians come and exile them, and they are kind of wiped out at that point, by and large. The southern kingdom, led by David's descendants, perseveres for a time They have some good kings who love the Lord. They have lots of kings who don't. Ultimately, they suffer the same fate, not by the Assyrians, but by the Babylonians. So God says, you know what? Okay, I've warned you again and again and again and again and again. 
and they didn't they they would never stay true to the Lord. And so ultimately God allows the Babylonians to conquer them. They destroy Jerusalem, they exile the people. Later, when the Persian Empire conquers the Babylonians, the Persians allow uh, the, the, what was the southern kingdom, those folks now known as Jews from Judah, the, the Jews to go back to their land. And so they, many of them go back to their land. They start to rebuild and whatnot. They rebuild the temple. But for a long time, the wall of Jerusalem, which was critical in those days, remained broken down. It was, it was, it, that, that was your def- city defenses broken down. So Nehemiah undertakes the project to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. That's what most folks know Nehemiah for. But later in Nehemiah, we see some other really important stuff that happens after the wall is completed. After the wall is completed, there's an instance where they come out, they all gather together, and they say, we have the law of God. We have basically what would be for us uh, the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, but probably in particular like uh, the book of Deuteronomy and whatnot. So, okay, so they stand up, they read the Scripture to the people and explain it. These are people, they identify themselves as the people of God, but they're unfamiliar with God's Word. And so they're basically preaching the Word to them as a gathered people, much like what I'm trying to do right now. Now, their initial response when they hear God's law is they're broken. They're like, oh my goodness, whoa, we broke this big time. No wonder all this has happened to our people. And initially, they're told, don't weep, let's celebrate, okay? There's, there's a time for weeping and there's a time for celebrating. Let's start off by celebrating. So they celebrate. But then they come back together and they say, okay, now it's time to weep. Now it's time to put some of this into practice and to recognize that we are not living by the law of God. And so they hear the law of God being read and explained, and basically this group of people makes a covenant. That's the passage that... that brother Gabe read is now this group has heard God's word they've reflected on it and they're saying this is what we're going to commit to do as our attempt to keep God's law we are going we want to be obedient to the word of God so here is our here's what we're going to commit to do the first thing in the passage Gabe read was that they were not going to marry uh, from the peoples that were surrounding them. Now, this is not racism or anything like that. It's because the peoples around them did not worship the same God. And so that got the, their, predi- their forefathers into trouble. And so they're saying, we're not going to do that. So that's part of it. Then they say they're going to keep the Sabbath. That, that had been a big hang up for their, their forefathers. They did not keep the Sabbath, and so that was something in the Old Testament law. They weren't, their, their forefathers didn't keep it. They say, we're going to keep the Sabbath. Then the bulk of the passage focuses on the various ways that they are committing to provide for the house of God. Uh, Gary, if you could bring up the last verse in that passage. I think it's verse 39. Um, It says, this is the conclusion that they come to after all the things that they say they're going to provide. They're going to provide a third of a shekel annually. They're going to provide for the wood. They're going to provide this and that and this. After the whole thing of what they say they're going to provide, their summary statement is this. Thus, we will not neglect the house of our God. That's the summary. That's their conclusion that they came to is that their, their, their ancestors, one of the ways that their ancestors had sinned greatly was in the neglect of the temple. Now, they've rebuilt the temple, and they're saying, we're not going to do what they did. We're going to make sure that we're contributing in these various ways to make sure that we're facilitating the worship of God. This has to be a priority for us. We're going to do this. And so that is what they are committing to. Now, if you fast forward in the book of Nehemiah, their resolve lasts for a season. Nehemiah goes away. He comes back and he's like, hey, what's going on, guys? And they're, they're bra- basically breaking everything that they've committed to do, which is the tendency of humans, right? We, we, we have resolve and then we fall away from it. That's what New Year's resolutions, right? Every year. It's like, I'm going to do this this year. And then you check back with them on like March 10th and they're like, what happened to that? It's like, eh, well, you know. And that's really what happened. So Nehemiah comes back after a season and he sees, oh, you're not doing A, you're not doing B, and you're not doing C. And how C is manifested is he comes in and he's like, where's the Levites? Oh, they're out working their fields. Why are they working their fields? 
uh, because the people weren't bringing this stuff and they had to survive. And so that's really what happens. And so ultimately, Nehemiah tries to correct it, and that goes from there. All right, let me move on from Nehemiah. I love that book, but we're going to move on from there. Let's go to Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is pretty strong in his words. This is the last book in the Old Testament. Um, and in fact, many times if you've ever heard a sermon on giving in church, probably some, some, some of my peers would probably go right to Malachi and just like, boom, I don't want to do that, okay? Uh, we we want to present an overview of Scripture, and so I feel like it's not appropriate for me to just start there and hammer on it or whatever. So I don't want to hammer on it anyway. Malachi chapter 3, again, this is the Israelites after they've come back from the exile, but before the birth of Christ, says, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. And so, really just a couple things I want to point out in this. Um, Number one uh, is the vertical aspect of our giving. To this point, I've tried to stress the horizontal aspect of our giving, that God uses the giving of his people to provide for uh, corporate worship, for ministry and missions. And so much of that is horizontal. It takes care of the needs of the temple, the facility. It takes care of the offerings themselves. In that case, in those days, the sacrifices. It takes care of the Levites and the priests or whatever. But there is this important vertical dimension. And basically what God is telling Israel at that time is, look, you're having lots of problems, and and the issue is that you're robbing me. You're not giving me what is due, and when you do that, it goes poorly for you. So test me in this, um, and I will bless you. Now, again, my point is not like, we do have to think about how that applies to the New Testament believer, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And so I'm not going to sit here... And just say, you're robbing God or whatever. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to do that this morning. But what I am going to say is there's a principle here that this is not just a horizontal issue. This is a vertical issue. When I say a vertical issue, I mean this is a spiritual issue, right? We think about giving purely in terms of practicality. Well, if we don't give, this happens or whatever. And those things need to be discussed. But at the end of the day, this is a spiritual issue, friends. God does see uh, what God cares how we steward our lives, and as a part of that, He cares how we steward His money, which ultimately He gives us some control over. Now, I want to take us to the New Testament. Um, if we stopped in the Old Testament there, I think there would be a lot of questions. Well, like, how does this apply to us in the New Testament? That's just Old Testament stuff. And those would be valid questions. But I think we want to look a little bit about what the New Testament says. Uh, What does the New Testament teach about the subject of giving? So Luke chapter 8, I have preached this before. Luke chapter 8, just a few verses there. It says, Soon afterwards, he, that is Jesus, began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, the disciples or the apostles, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Cusa, uh, or Chusa, the Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who are contributing to their support out of their private means. And so what we have is here in Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus and the apostles are going around from place to place. They're preaching God's word. Jesus is performing miracles. All these things are taking place. And what Luke is letting us know is it's not just Jesus and Peter and, J- and, uh, and James and John and so on and so forth. There's also this group of women that is traveling with them. And one of the things that the women are doing is out of their means, they are contributing to the support of them as they go. Now, as I reflected on this passage, one of the things that hit me is why was this necessary? Right? Why, why, did, this hap- why, why did it happen like this? 
right? If you read the Gospels, Jesus took a few loaves and some fish, and he fed 5,000 men plus the women and children. So what? And Jesus healed sick people. He raised up dead people. He didn't just feed the 5,000. Actually, there's another instance recorded in the Gospels when he fed 4,000 people. And when the disciples are on the boat and Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and they're like, oh, it's because we forgot the bread. Jesus is like, come on, guys. Did you not see what I did with a little bit and how it spread? So why didn't Jesus do that with respect to this? Could Jesus not... Could, could they have not just asked somebody for a loaf of bread and Jesus said, hey, 5, 000, I can do 5,000, like 15 or 20 of you is easy. Like, here you go, or whatever. Could he not have done that? Absolutely, Jesus could have done that. But he didn't. Instead, what they were doing is they were, they were using the support that was given by these women. Well, how do you know he didn't multiply that? Well, he may have, okay? I get it, right? You can ask those types of, for the philosophically minded you can dwell on those questions. The text doesn't tell us this. It just tells us that they're living on the support that's given by these women out of their private means. The point that I'm trying to make is now what we're seeing in the New Testament with Jesus and his disciples during his earthly ministry is in some form a continuation of the pattern that was begun in the Old Testament. That people, the people of God are giving to support the ministry and mission. And so here I would stress the mission part of it because they're going and preaching the kingdom of God. And that how are they making it? They're making it based on the contributions of these ladies. And so this is a part of how God is working there, even though Jesus easily could have provided for them in some other way, shape, or form. Now, later in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 11, we see another reference. This time it's a, a, one of the references, the few references to tithing in the New Testament. And so Jesus, in a passage where he's pronouncing these woes on the Pharisees as a group, he's basically giving them the verbal beatdown. He's saying, look, this is woe to you Pharisees, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you Pharisees. Well, here in this verse, it's interesting. Luke chapter 11, verse 42, Jesus says, But woe to you Pharisees, for you pay tithe of mint and rue and every kind of garden herb, and yet disregard justice and the love of God. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. That, little la- that last little prepositional phrase, without neglecting the others, that's very interesting. What is Jesus referring to there? What Jesus is saying is, you have missed the weightier matters of the law. You are very scrupulous in keeping the smallest little details, but you've missed the big picture. You neglect love and justice, mercy, things that are undergirding the entirety of the law, you miss that completely. But then Jesus makes this statement. He says, you should have had that, but not disregarded what you're already doing with your tithing. In other words, Jesus is affirming their practice of tithing. Now, I realize, again, when we start talking about the application of the Old Testament law for New Testament believers, if I'm going to the Gospels, this is kind of pre-church in, this in, in some ways. I, I understand there's some theological nuancing there. But it's very interesting to me that Jesus does not say, why do you care about tithing these small little things? Like you should have been thinking about love and justice and just left it there. But he doesn't do that. He says, without disregarding the other words. In other words, the internals are the most important. But as a result of the internals, you should also be doing the externals. And so here, the tithing does matter. It is important, and you should continue to do that, but not neglect the weightier matters. That's what Jesus is saying there. Now, I want to take us. i got two more places, and then I promise you we're going we're to move forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. My point here is to show that the principle that was there in the Old Testament is still applicable, and well, at least part of it is, in the New Testament age. Paul says this to the Corinthian church, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my work in the Lord? If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas or Peter? 
Or do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or who tends a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope, and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. And so basically my point in bringing this up is this is a continuation of the pattern that was set in the Old Testament, and Paul explicitly says that. Paul writes, do you not know what's written in the law? Don't muzzle the ox while it's threshing. Say, God, well, God probably, he's kind of being tongue-in-cheek there. I'm sure God's concerned about oxen. But at the end of the day, the bigger picture is uh, if you muzzle the ox while he's threshing, he can't eat any of what, what the stuff is there. And so what Paul is doing is he's making a point. He's saying, look, even in the Old Testament law, those who perform the sacred services, uh, they, they got their provision from that. And so the same pattern applies in the New Testament age with the church. Those who proclaim the gospel get their living from the gospel. And so where does that come from? It comes from the giving of God's people, just like it did in the Old Testament. And so um, can this be abused? Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember one time, I think, it, I don't, I think it, it was either Holly or maybe Tommy or somebody told our boys to watch these uh, videos or something about these uh, health and wealth preachers or something. And I remember we were watching some of them, and there was one where the guy was, he was boasting about, he had pictures of his jet planes, and he was boasting about this jet and that jet. or that. That's not right, folks. Uh, that, that, is, that is an abuse of this, okay? We, I think we can call that rightfully so. I don't think anyone in here has picture in, on the wall of all your jets that you've had or whatever. I don't either, right? Here's my, here's my Dodge Aries. It was my first car, right? It was a hand-me-down. Everybody in my family drove that car. By the time it got to me, man, it had a lot of miles on it. Look at that. Here's my Chevy Cavalier that I bought after that or whatever. Here's my Mazda Protégé, right, that I still have 20 years later. Look. That you can, everything can be taken to extremes, and it does get abused, but it doesn't change the basic fact that the pattern that God set in Scripture is that the people of God give, and that provides for the corporate worship of, of, corporate worship of God's people for ministry and for missions. And as a part of that is provision for voca- those who minister vocationally, which happens to be yours truly and Pastor Mark in our context here. And so, again, that is a part of it. And Paul's saying that's not wrong. That's the pattern that God set. Now, there are other instances in which giving is both uh, recommended and is needed, is uh, admirable beyond just the basic things that we're talking about here. And that's where I want to close this as far as the Scriptures go this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, I thought about preaching on 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and part of the reason that I didn't do that is because the offering that is in view there is a special offering that was given for the relief of the poor in Jerusalem. And so, uh, because of persecution and other things, the believers in Jerusalem were subject to, there was effectively horrible conditions, and they had no provision or minimal. And so, Paul went to the other churches, the Gentile churches, and laid out the issue there. And so they were contributing for the relief of the poor among their brothers in Jerusalem. Um, And so it's in that context that we read this in 2 Corinthians 9. Paul writes, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Friends, what I would call this passage is uh, maybe a New Testament adaptation of what we read in Malachi. This, in part, sets giving as a spiritual issue. Right? Paul says, not giving under compulsion or begrudgingly, which it certainly is possible to do. Right? It would be entirely possible for someone to hear this sermon today to walk out and with an angry kind of, well, I guess Pastor Kevin wants us to give more of our money, and so uh, I'll, I'll do that, but I'm going to not like doing it. That, that is, that, friends, don't do that. Okay? That's called giving begrudgingly, and that is not what's in view here in 2 Corinthians 9. What's here, it, it, it says... God cares about what's going on in our hearts and our minds. And so if we give under compulsion because of arm twisting, sow your seed, I'll twist your arm or whatever. No, 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 no. Or you give begrudgingly, that is violating the spirit of what's, and this is very much, and it's basically, he says there in the next verse, uh, I believe it was verse, I don't have it pulled up, maybe Gary, verse 8 there, if you could pull that one back up, 2 Corinthians uh, 9, verse 8. It says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. In other words, God honors giving. And so if we give with the right spirit, we give generously out of a right heart, God honors that. And so again, this is a spiritual issue. Now I want to take just a moment before we get into the application um, to ask this basic question, because I guarantee you this is going through somebody's head here. Is the tithe applicable for New Testament believers? If you Google that, you will get a wide, vast range of responses on that. You will see all, and I've done that, and you get all kind of, people are all over the map on that issue. So I want to acknowledge that. But I also want to tell you why I come down where I do. And I would hope that after almost nine years here that my word does carry some weight with you. So, so let me say this. Um, when I have seen people arguing vigorously against the application of tithing for New Testament believers, when they, they say, oh, that's just Old Testament, whatever, um, the question that, that comes in my head is always this, why? Why is it that you are arguing so vigorously against this practice? Like, what's going on in your own heart and mind? Not that I can see that, but what, what, is, what is the motivation behind that? And maybe it's because of my background or whatever that there's even a little bit more suspicion on that um, because my, my fear is that some who use their intelligence and their kind of theological skill to break things down and parse it to argue super vigorously against the practice of tithing for New Testament believers, that this is a, a, a subset of their own poor churchmanship. And so I've lived in an academic context for a long time, friends, and I'm going to sound like I'm undercutting all of theological education. That's not my intent to do that. But I can tell you, sadly, that many of my own professors and people I saw in a seminary context over the years were very poor church members. Their their churchmanship was garbage. And so if your churchmanship is so poor, of course you're going to try to argue that you don't need to give because you're not invested, right? That's a problem, friends. And so the, the, I'm asking, why is that the case? Now, I, I, I want to be careful in saying that, not to attribute that motive to every person who doesn't believe in tithing for New Testament believers, because I don't think that's the case for everybody. But there, the other question that comes up from that in some context, and this is how John Piper deals with the topic, is this. Why is the bar lower for New Testament believers than it is for people in the Old Testament? Right? When do we lower the bar? I had this conversation with Lynn in the hallway before the service today. You read the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, you've heard that it was written such and such, right? You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman with lust in her heart has committed adul- with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. And so the bar goes from here to like, boom. You say, well, have you committed adultery? No, I've never committed adultery. Have you ever lusted after a woman? Every guy's like, yep, yep, done that, right? This is, the, the, Jesus is dealing with the heart issues, friends. 
And so the, every instance in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus is going through parts of the Old Testament law and explaining it, the bar always goes up, right? So why would we get to this issue and suddenly lower the bar and say, well, you know, that was Old Testament believers. We ought not do that. Now, another argument that comes up, um, let me back up for a second on that. Um, I, I was questioning this myself a few years ago, and I went to a pastor friend of mine, and I, and I had somebody I trust, godly man, loves Jesus, solid pastor, way smarter than I am. And I said to him, what, what is your take on that? And he said, it's difficult to, to see a specific thou shalt for, for New Testament believers to tithe. However, there's this large pattern that's set in Scripture here, and it seems difficult for me to, to say we should deviate from that. Why would we, what is that in there for if we, we're, we should deviate for that? Friends, I think that's a good principle. And so full disclosure, I'm not, I don't want somebody to come up to me afterward and rebuke me. Don't you know the Scripture about don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing? Yes, I know it. I just quoted it, Okay. But also, as one of your, your leaders, spiritually, I want to say, put your money where your mouth is. We tithe, friends. And we've always had a roof over our heads. Money's tight sometimes. Right now, the economy, like I, I, every person in here probably has been hit by the economic conditions of the last few years. We have as well. But we have not stopped in our giving. And we trust that God will provide for us. And he always has, sometimes in very unusual ways. And yet God does provide and has provided for our family. We have a roof over our heads, friends. We're still here. So, even in the, one last thing on the tithing. Uh, even in the Old Testament period, there were some shifts in the application of the law. And so, what you're seeing in the book of Nehemiah is their attempt to take the Old Testament law and apply it in their time. And so they're making some adjustments. Friends, I know probably nobody wants to read the book of First Chronicles as their first book in the Bible or whatever, because it's very difficult. But the latter part of the book of First Chronicles is David adapting God's law to the time of the temple. Because the Levites were charged with taking care of the tabernacle, the tent. Well, what do you do when there's no more tent? So the Levites are like, hey, what do you, hey get to work, guys. They're like, hey, there's no more tent. I don't know what to do. So David's like, well, let me tell you what you're going to do. We're going to set up these people as singers. Hope you can sing. We're going to set up these folks, whatever. And that's what David does. And so there's always this adaptation of God's law for later periods. And I think we have to think about that. The basic principle still applies, friends. Uh, in the early church, Paul says, how do you provide for those who minister vocationally? The people of God do it. They didn't have church buildings, but I'm sure if they had needs, they would have looked to their God, the scriptures they had, which was the Old Testament, that said God's people's giving provides for that. So, all right, let me get to the application and things to consider. We're going to hit these pretty quickly. Um, all right, number one, giving must be understood in the larger context of life stewardship. If you don't do that, then you're going to look at this. The, the, the classic error there is, well, you give 10% to God, and the 90% is yours. Uh, baloney. The 90% belongs to God just like the 10% does, right? Why? Because a biblical view of life stewardship is that all of me, all of you as a follower of Christ, belongs to Jesus. Out at the Ridge Connection, we've got that little diagram that I made or whatever. I'd encourage you to go out and look at that. We don't segment Jesus in our lives. He's Lord of all. And so if he's Lord of all, he's Lord of my money, and part of that is I want to be, honor him through giving. So again, giving must be understood in the larger context of life stewardship. How can I honor Jesus in this? I would say the scriptural admonition would be give generously. Number two, giving is a spiritual issue, not just a practical one. Now, it, it, I've noticed I put just because it is a practical issue, but it's also a spiritual issue. And so uh, the reality is the spirit in which the giving is done matters, and friends, it's an act of worship when we give. I mean, I can definitely think of other ways that I could spend the money that, that we, we give to the church. I, I could think of lots of other ways to spend that. I could probably spend all of it on food, and I guarantee you'd get eaten in my house, right? But I don't do that. Why? Because I th it's important to invest in what God is doing uh, and to be obedient in that issue. Number three, God honors obedience and devotion in giving. Um, 
Friends, again, this is not health and wealth. We're not, there's no promise of riches and wealth in this. That, that, is, that is one of the worst features in my mind of that sort of teaching, a distortion of biblical teaching, is it is so unkind to people who are impoverished. Like, well, you must be sinning because you don't have a lot of money. If you were, if you were doing what God wants you, you'd be wealthy. Yeah, that's bogus. That is not what God's Word teaches, but God blesses in other ways. And there are lots of ways that God can pour out blessings on you that are not materially. He will care for you, but there are other ways that God can bless you. All right, last one. A movement towards obedience and giving may take time, intentionality, and sacrifice. Um, friends, this is a practical issue, and for some of you, if you're hearing this for the first time and you're like, giving 10%, yeah, right, what in the world? Do you know what that would do to my finances? Look, I realize that. And I, so what I'm saying is sometimes movement towards obedience takes time and intentionality and effort. And so if, if the goal is to be here and I'm here, I don't say, well, I guess I better just not do anything because I can't get here. I say, well, how can I get here? How can I get here? How can I get here? And so God honors our intentionality and our obedience. And so maybe I'm looking at, and there's lots of different ways you could flesh this out. For some, this may require training and help in financial matters. Some people are better with money than others. And sometimes you, you need some help, and we've got folks that can help with that. Um, sometimes it just starts by examining our own situation and saying, where am I at in my giving? Right? I'm here. I don't want to stay here. How can I get from here to here? Are there changes I could make? Are there things that could happen for me to be able to, to give more generously? Um, again, the intentionality matters because God sees our hearts. Now, this is, the, I promise you, this is the last thing I'm going to say, and that's this. No, from a purely human standpoint, nobody wants to throw their money towards something that they feel like is, is, is going downhill or is a failure or whatever. And let me just say this, I see life in this church and I see things going on in this church context that don't happen other places, that give me great hope that God is at work among the people of Rikers Ridge Baptist Church. Let me share a few of those and hopefully these resonate with you. Not to embarrass a brother, but I'm going to embarrass Brother PJ. I, I told him the other night, I uh, was talking with Brother PJ, um, how often does it happen that the family of a former pastor would stay in the church that that, that that pastor has since moved on, that that family would stay. And quite honestly, your whole family would be here if it weren't for different circumstances uh, and, and good circumstances. One got married and moved to where her spouse was. Wonderful. Great. Praise God. Another one we sent out to minister in another church. And then another one is across the world somewhere ministering uh, on mission. Praise God. And yet, and here is this brother who's growing in Jesus. He's growing in his leadership of his family. And in fact, we've recognized that by affirming him as a deacon in this church. Friends, that doesn't happen. You don't see that kind of thing going on in other places. But lo and behold, it's happening here. Last week, my son preached a sermon. Praise God. But the week before that, who filled the pulpit? Brother Holly. And the week before that, who filled the pulpit? Brother Rob. Friends, we have people, and if Pastor Mark is in the mix, we have multiple people in this church that are capable of filling the pulpit, opening God's Word, explaining it, and applying it. That is a blessing. I have friends who don't have that. I have friends who, when they, they want to go on vacation or do something, they're struggling to find someone to fill the pulpit. And in a church our size, for me to be able to say, well, who am I going to pick? to fill it that week. Praise God for that, friends. That's a blessing that many churches don't have. I don't have this in my notes, but someone visited us recently, and the comment they made as they almost tripped over a small child was, wow, you have some kids running around here. I don't see that in some other churches. Praise God. Don't trip over our small children, please. Uh, we would appreciate that. But praise God for that. that. That is a blessing. And God is at work in these young families. And I can tell you that God is working there. The love and support for 
uh, both the Lees and the Todds in recent days. I mean, I don't know who wrote the email. It was probably Lynn. It might have been Carol. Whoever wrote the email talked about that. Um, you know the thing that Mark, uh, when I visited with Mark a couple times ago, um, I mean, dude, he's got health problems. It's, it's, it's getting better, but it's not good. I, I would never want to be where Mark's at. And of all the things that Mark could have been upset about, Mark started crying. I'm going to embarrass him. He's watching. He can yell at me later. That's fine. I love you, Mark. If you want to yell at me, you can yell at me. The one thing that brought Mark to tears is that he misses being here with you. He was crying because he wanted to be, he's a big baby. He, he was crying because he missed the church. Friends, that, 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 that love and support. I was somewhere else recently, and one of our newer members uh, said so, I was there, and, and she was there, and um, so he said, oh, I didn't know you were in his church. And then when I was sitting there talking with her, she said, I just love our church. Praise God. Even on that note, several of the people who have come to the church, who have joined or are, are regular visitors to this church over the last three or four years, are folks who were not in a church either ever or for quite some time. And now, I'm not, I'm not dismissing if you came here from another church, I'm glad that you're here, but the way that we desire for this church to grow is to reach people who are not in a church. They're unchurched, right? Right? People need the Lord. And we have several folks that are here, that, are, that, that, that love it, that are hungry, that have come out of a place where they've not been in church or have not been in church for some time. Friends, praise God for that. There is a hunger for God's Word. People's lives are being transformed by Jesus here. I see it. I've known most of you for quite some time now. Again, coming up on nine years. And so I've seen changes in progression in people. And I'm seeing people grow in Jesus, mature in their faith, their walk with Christ. And I look at those things and I'm saying, God is at work here. Yes, we have challenges, just like most churches in America right now. Okay? But that does not mean that this is dead or anything like that. Now, look, when it comes to giving, whether you felt like the church was dead or not, you still have to deal with the issue of obedience and all the things that I talked about before. But from a purely human standpoint, what I would say is I want to invest in those things where I see God at work. And friends, from this vantage point, I see God at work here, right here among these people. And so when it comes to giving, friends, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's pray. Father, our lives are yours. I don't know why. I, I guess it's just our fallen nature. Why, when it comes to this topic of, of money and giving, it becomes so difficult for us to yield those things to you. We worry about money. Chief of sinners here. We, uh, we, we struggle. We, we want things. We, we desire to have this and that and whatever. And through all of this, then uh, giving becomes a sore topic. It becomes something that we don't want to deal with. It becomes something that we, we resent. God, forgive us for this. The reality is that you are a giving God. And you gave far beyond what any of us could even imagine when you willingly gave your own son who bled and died, not for his own sin, but for the sins of others. And then he rose again. And because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, because you are a giving God, and you gave Christ, ruined, wrecked sinners like us could be made whole, could be forgiven, could have new life in Christ. So Lord, thank you for your giving which is far beyond what any of us could ever hope to give. And yet in this, as, as a part of our worship, Lord, would you stir our own hearts so that we would give faithfully and generously, not for the approval of man. That's like the, the, the parable with the Pharisee. But because we desire to honor you. And in this, from what we've seen in your word, you honor that. And for that, we give you thanks. 
Lord, we love you. We pray that you'd continue to work in our midst. What you, what you have started, we pray that you would continue until that day when Christ returns. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.